Today in a special episode, we'll be interviewing physician, author, and podcaster, Dr. Sydney McElroy. This is Doctor vs. Comedian. I'm Dr. Asif Doja, and this is the Doctor of Laughs. Not a real doctor. Ali Hassan. Every episode, what we usually do is I pick a topic for Ali from comedy and entertainment, and I question him about it. Then Ali picks a topic from medicine and health and grills me on that topic. But today is a special episode. Today we'll be interviewing Dr. Sydney McElroy. She is a family doctor and assistant professor at the Marshall University School of Medicine in Huntington, West Virginia, and is the co-host of the podcasts Sawbones and Still Buffering. Dr. McElroy, welcome to Doctor versus Comedian. Thank you so much for having me. I'm excited to be here. Yeah, there's the verses in our name, which sounds antagonistic, but it's this is more like we welcome the doctor, <laughs> right? For once, I'm not very welcoming of Asif Doja, but I'm welcoming of Sydney McElroy. Well, thank you. I mean, that could be the definition of my marriage, doctor versus comedian. So. <laughs> right. Well, we were talking about that actually before before you came on the line with us about how uh, I think Ali's feeling good about your co-host, Justin, because who's your, your, your spouse, because Ali thinks he should be more silly and make more jokes when we're talking about the medicine aspect of our, of our podcast. <laughs> no, I think I think that's the art of it, right, is to just get the right amount of jokes in there. And sometimes I have to set the tone for Justin ahead of time. Mm-hmm. Like, we don't need mm-hmm. too much. You got to tone it down this time. Keep yeah, it. Okay. Okay. That's good to know because Asif is definitely that guy. <laughs> I'll, right. be, I'll be on a roll and Asif will be like, um, I'm going to stop you there. Time out. We're going to go back. We're going to edit that. We're going to pretend you never said that because that <laughs> is right. super inappropriate. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I'm like, ah, I'm just being me. He's like, no, don't do that. that. That's one of the dangers too. Justin never knows what we're going to talk about ahead of time. And so sometimes... Oh. He, he'll start going down a road and I'll be going, no, 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 don't, mm-mm. you don't want to joke about that. Actually, this is going somewhere you don't know. You don't, you don't want to joke about that. <laughs> exactly. See what well, we're kindred spirits, Sydney and I. So in fact, let's just take a step back here because you have a couple of very wildly successful podcasts. The one we're talking about that you do with your husband is called Sawbones. And I think many, many of our listeners have heard about it. But for those of you who haven't, it's described as a marital tour of misguided medicine. And in it, you kind of discuss medicine through the ages, a lot of very interesting historical medicine. And it's really a hugely successful podcast, one of the most, uh, the one of the biggest medical podcasts in the world, actually, and has a huge following. So maybe let's just backtrack a bit. It's you've been doing it for I think since 2013. What was the inspiration for you and and uh, Justin, your your partner, starting the podcast? So that's right. We've been doing it since 2013, and prior to that, Justin got into pod like podcasting in general first. He started with some video game, because he, he was a video game journalist before his right. podcasting career. And, you know, I mean, I say was, that sounds like he doesn't have those skills. He would, he would <laughs> resent that. <laughs> but he started. In- he's not here. Freedom <laughs> to say whatever you want to say, Sydney. Now's your moment. <laughs> That's true. He's not here. <laughs> but uh, he started with podcasts there. And then he started doing this podcast with his brothers, my brother, my brother and me, which became very successful, Mm -hmm. which was like comedy advice kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. And he was having fun doing it. And we started joking about like, we should, we should do our own thing just for fun. And we tried a couple different iterations of what that was like. This was all pre us having children. So we used to watch TV Mm -hmm. that wasn't cartoons and Mm -hmm. we would watch TV and talk about it. And so we had like a podcast where, (laughs) where we watched two and a half men after Charlie Sheen left the show, called it losing the sheen. And we just, talked about we had no frame of reference for the show and we would watch it and talk about it and then we just made this general tv podcast called satellite dish where we just talked about bad tv that we watched and after a while i was like we just don't i am too busy i was in med school and then residency during all this time and i was like i don't have time to do all this anymore justin (laughs) i'm too busy to watch tv and he said well i really like doing this with you what what's something we could do that would draw on like your interests, your expertise, your knowledge, stuff that might actually help you <laughs> with your day job. <laughs> right. Right. And that was how we fell into medical history. I'd always had a, an interest in that. I had some books already that I'd collected just because I like to read about it. But that's not really something, at least in my medical school, that I had been 
taught much about. And we should we should paint the picture here that 2021, 22, the conventional wisdom or the conventional line is every people say, you know, everybody and their mother has a podcast these days. 2013 is kind of the flip where people were still like, what is a podcast exactly? Right. You guys are really at the forefront of this uh, this whole thing. What what made you think of were you just looking sort of for an alternative to a radio show or did you even did you have an understanding of what podcasts were and what the potential was? I did not at all. Justin, I would say, did. He had an inkling. His And I should say, so his dad was a local radio DJ until he retired in this area. So radio is very much in there. People who've listened to Sawbones would know his dad because he does the intro, which is one of my favorite intros of any show. <laughs> it's for fun. You know, just fun. And he like <laughs> chastises you for thinking that this might be serious immediately, which sets such a great tone. Clint is his father. I think, exactly. Right? Yes. Clint. Yeah. And he's part of they do a different podcast called The Adventure Zone, which is the three brothers right. and their dad playing D&D together, which is very funny. And they're all very funny. I mean, I've I've known Justin and his family. We grew up together. So we're from Huntington, West Virginia. We grew up here. We started doing community theater together. And that's how we all met. Oh, wow. We're all. We're all very dramatic, attention-seeking people, I guess. <laughs> mm. They already had this sort of radio background. So I think Justin kind of knew early on that podcasting was the next, that was where radio was going. Like all these radio shows that people like, this is the best form of it. I think he already had some idea. I don't think anybody knew, certainly, that our shows would become popular. When we started doing it, it was truly, Justin and I love talking to each other. I were married. <laughs> and I like telling him about this medical history stuff that I find interesting. And he likes making jokes about everything. And sure. we thought, well, this will be fun. And if someone likes it, great. If anybody listens, great. Maybe they'll win a round of pub trivia because of something they learned on our <laughs> show. And I'll feel good about that. And that was really the best we had hoped for. We had no idea that we would get as many listeners as we did, or that we'd ever do live shows or write a book. I mean, none of that was in the in the plan. It was just, let's have fun and see what happens. Which actually makes it so much more of a, a, a kind of a special origin story, the organic nature with which it started. You're not looking for the end goal. You're just like, well, medical history, I like it. And he's probably like, oh, I enjoy hearing about people in the old days saying things like, oh, you'll feel much better after a good bleeding. <laughs> and I can make fun of that. And you can, right? It's just uh, organically, it just comes together. You're talking about something that interests you. And he ta he's talking about something he can mock mercilessly. Exactly. And uh, there you go. <laughs> yeah. And so where that love of medical history for you come from? Because it's not the type of thing, you know, we get a bit of medical history in medical schools. I think it's very medical school dependent. But where did that kind of come about for you? You know, I think. I mean, it's always been part of my interest in medicine in general. When I decided I wanted to be a doctor when I was like 12, <laughs> a lot of it was from reading sort of fictionalized, like the hot zone, kind of like fictionalized accounts mm -hmm. of diseases and medicine and that kind of stuff that were, yes, true, but also sensationalized to some extent. I liked the story. I liked the narration around things. And so as I was learning stuff in medical school, I just had this natural kind of inclination to say, well, how in the world did we ever figure that out? Or why would we call it that? That was, I was always the one looking up every like eponym, like why is it named after this person and who were they? And also I was always the first one in class to say, you know, you shouldn't use that. That person was a jerk. <laughs> we should really change that name. Yeah, exactly. Did you, did anybody ever investigate why shingles are also called herpes zoster? This is a very touchy subject for me. No, please, please enlighten okay, me. I know. Well, I mean, this is just one of the, you know, shingles. What is the other word for shingles? It's a, the zona, I believe, right? It's called a zona. It's, you know, people refer to it as that, you know, that latent chicken pox virus that comes back in, 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 in later years. But then it's also called herpes zoster. And then every website will tell you not to be mistaken in any way for the herpes simplex virus, which leads me to say, then why call it herpes anything? Because once I tell someone I have herpes zoster, I can't be like, don't worry, dude, it's the good one. Don't worry. Listen, you Cindy, I've tried to explain this to him that there's many types of herpes virus. That I just, I don't know. I, I'm not sure what, I, what else I can do here. It's, no, there's it's nothing not, else. You I can understand do. that though. Anytime, any, <laughs> we just, we did it. Uh, I don't even think it's gone up yet. We do episodes periodically where we just let people send us their kind of medical questions, not 
diagnostic kind of, I never try to give advice, right, but like, right. Hey, why does this work this way? Or what's this weird thing? Or, you know, that weird medical questions. And uh, somebody asked about pityriasis and why does it happen? And I, which is this, this rash. And the, the answer is we don't know exactly, but we think it's a herpes virus. And that was the next thing I said. Now, when I say a herpes virus, not the herpes you're thinking yeah. of. Yeah. <laughs> There's lots of herpes. It's a different herpes. And we're not sure, but it might be a herpes, but don't not that herpes. I, I, You do have to say that. It's a shame. There shouldn't be the stigma. Well, this is it. Can you not just picture somebody in a bar chasing after some woman going, no, 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 not that herpes. It's a different, ah, <laughs> oh, forget it. Lost another There's one. Lots of herpes. <laughs> yeah, there's lots of herpes. You heard it here first. <laughs> Not you didn't hear it first, but I'm hearing it here first. <laughs> you, uh, you. Anyway, he's already heard it once. But I anyway, don't listen to you. <laughs> I don't that's, listen. That's to you. our that's point. That's why we have Sydney on. Some <laughs> incredible <laughs> that, show. Finally, so let's talk about your other podcast, which sounds weird to say after you know we've talked about how popular one is. But I, you know, I also live in this world where I have two podcasts. Sometimes these things are just enjoyable. And again, this feels like it had an organic start to it because it is your sister's your sister's so it's called still buffering and it's called a cross generational guide so you think it's a mom daughter and then granddaughter but in fact it's three sisters you just have a large age gap between the three of you we do that and it actually it's true all of our podcasts feel like kind of spinoffs so we did an episode of sawbones and justin was actually he was at it was back when he was still doing video game journalism too and so he was at some sort of conference or convention and so he was out of town but we hadn't recorded one ahead of time and we needed an episode and my my little sister Riley who was born my senior year of high school so we have like a 17 year age oh, wow. gap. way to plan things mom and dad I know. <laughs> she, was, <laughs> she was our surprise <laughs> but I we were trying to think like what can we do because we didn't want to miss a week and I don't know if Justin and I came up with it or if Riley was part of the idea but we said, you know, what, what would be funny is to do sort of an episode about a teen girl because she was, oh gosh, she was quite a young teen, like 14 or 15. Mm -hmm. at the time. And we'll pretend that it's Justin in a teen body for the episode, like a, <laughs> like a Freaky Friday kind of situation. Yeah. And so we did that. And Riley just naturally is very funny because she was so little when Justin and I started dating and, and we've been together a long time. She already had a lot of sort of Justin's comedic timing and his beats. Like she hit a lot of the same sorts of notes he would. And the response was really great. People really loved it. They thought it was so funny. They thought Riley was so funny. And after that, I said, hey, do you want to do a podcast where we talk about like what it's like to be a teen then and now, because it was so different for me than it is for Riley, because there's such a gap. And then it was just natural to say, and we should include our other sibling, Taylor, in that conversation. And all three mm -hmm. of us can talk about the differences. And so the, the show has had to sort of grow over the years because Riley is no longer a teen. She is now 21. Mm, right. <laughs> but we still get to kind of, you know, compare and contrast what it was like. And I get to entertain, you know, Riley, both Taylor and I do with things like, so we used to have pagers for some reason. I don't know. It was a team. Yeah. <laughs> oh, uh, you mean not in medicine? You you and your sister had pagers like just walking around the street. You'd have a pager. Oh, yeah. That was it was very popular back oh, wow. in the 90s to like before cell phones, before all that, you would just have a pager and you would have codes you learned to send to your friends on your pagers. Oh, my God. And, I mean, wow. When you got your page, you still had to use like your parent's phone like your landline to call somebody else on their landline and <laughs> sure. oh, mr so-and-so is, <laughs> is in, Sally there i don't want to speak for all canadians but i think generally we're in, in my circle of friends in canada pager equal drug dealer i mean it just uh, i don't know why that happened because because cell phones were also around and people still had pagers or like, OK, you want to remain anonymous for something very some nefarious activities, obviously. It, well, exactly. And in the teen world, it was very much like my recollection was you had a pager right up until, oh, there are cell phones. And then everybody except for doctors and maybe drug dealers got rid of their pager. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. I tried to explain uh, typewriters to my children, speaking of things that were around when I was a kid. And that was just the most useless exercise of my, they just, they could, but how did you delete things? No, you didn't, there was like liquid paper and no, but like, how did you like restart the dog? How did you save things? Like, no, no, there's no saving. You're just right. Ah, forget it. <laughs> so I felt 900 years old. 
I love those. I love telling Riley about things like Napster. Like there was this period of time where we mm-hmm. stole music. <laughs> and sometimes we would steal a clip, like a sound bite from a movie to have it on our desktop. And she's like, yeah. why? I'm like, I don't know. Cause we, <laughs> just, just, just because, yeah, I heard you guys talking about that. I listened to your Biff Naked episode the other day, and because I love Biff, you know, she's Canadian, so I yeah. love Biff Naked. And then you guys, that's exactly what you got. First of all, you bring me back to Napster and that craziness and trying to find it. Is it a real uh, version or not? And then you start playing it, and then there's like all this static yes. screechiness, right? Because it was uploaded by the record company to kind of discourage you from doing that. That's or right. you, you guys said one story about how it was just a song on repeat. I don't know if it. Was was you or or your sister Taylor, who was saying that, that. Was yeah. It, yeah yeah so anyway it is but yeah, you uh, had to look at the size of the file right and yeah like okay that suggests that it's legit and then they'd still get you they really they weren't very accommodating to our theft i must say no it's almost like they didn't want us to yeah, weird <laughs> it, it's funny when we talk about teen a lot of the stuff that taylor and i especially as we got to be older teens were into a lot of Canadian teen stuff comes up because we got this show or this channel for a while called the Inn, which was, I think like cool Nickelodeon or something mm-hmm, anyway, mm-hmm. but it would get Degrassi and radio mm-hmm. free Roscoe. And Oh my gosh, it was like Taylor and I would just watch this stuff. Like this is TV. There's nothing here like this. This is the real stuff. Canadians. Wow. We were on the cutting That's edge. <laughs> I've never met. So this was in West Virginia growing up, I guess. Right. Okay, that's interesting. Usually it's people on the Michigan border or the, um, you know, Wisconsin, maybe they get Canadian channels. I've never heard somebody, you know, deeper into America getting Canadian things. So you must have, were you like, when you saw Drake, you were like, I remember that guy from Degrassi. That's amazing. <laughs> I used to say that to Riley all the time. I was, she, cause she got really, she was of the age that like when Drake. Yeah. You know, first mm-hmm. it was like, oh, my gosh, Drake. And I was like, that's Jimmy. <laughs> <laughs> that's Jimmy. It's always Jimmy. <laughs> so um, a couple other questions then. Just looking at your life, <laughs> you know, you have two, we said, wildly successful podcasts, but we haven't even talked about your quote unquote day job. You you are a physician. And I'm just kind of curious, like, what does your practice look like in terms of that and then balancing your, your podcasting and, 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 and other things as well? Children. Children as well. Yeah. How old are your kids? I have I have two daughters. They are seven and almost four. Okay. So yeah. Waiting to hear about that podcast. <laughs> it feels like that one's right around the corner. R- Riley's going to coach them and mentor them. And then eventually, yeah. They would love to, especially my older daughter, Charlie. She already is constantly well, and she's of that generation. Not only does she want podcasts, which she does, she does one with my husband called the Charlie and Daddy Show, which I mean, it's not regular. They've released throughout the course of her life, like five or six, you know, it's just one of those things where sometimes she would wander into the studio and sit down and he would hit record. She wants to make her own YouTube videos because that's that. That's the thing now, right? Mm-hmm. Who wants to podcast yeah. on YouTube? <laughs> but I'm sure it's coming. Oh, this reminds me of when I, I, I recently went to uh, Whistler, which is a real like sort of ski ski town, uh, you know, uh, in, in, in British Columbia. And the driver who was driving us from the airport to Whistler said, the kids don't snowboard anymore. And I was like, what? He goes, yeah, because the kids, like young teens, are like snowboarding. My dad used to snowboard. And I'm like, oh, my God. So now I guess your kids are like podcasting. My parents podcast. I'm not going (laughs) to podcast. Mm -hmm. So they have to turn to other things. Podcasting is going to lose its popularity with a young generation. I know. That's what they, they want. The YouTube. I keep telling, we try really hard to keep the kids out of like any sort of pictures mm-hmm. or you know I've, sure. I've already told charlie like you can make all the videos for us and our family that you want but we're not putting yeah. it on the internet so yeah no. yeah not until you're old enough business. to understand the the ramifications of all mm-hmm. of that oh, mm-hmm. yeah. yeah absolutely yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. you know you have yeah. to train them you have to deliver constant hate <laughs> and uh, heckling and belittling in the house to train them for the world of youtube right just these yeah, things I mean, don't happen true. over yeah <laughs> Unfortunately. my practice has really changed in part because of the podcast and all the stuff that we've done related to it, in part because we had kids. Mm-hmm. I am I'm a family medicine physician, so I and and I've grown up and trained in the same, you know, in Huntington pretty much my whole life. I went to undergrad here and completed med school here, did my residency training in the department where I now work and am an assistant professor. So I've kind of stayed put. 
And when I first started, I was doing a very traditional family medicine practice, well, academic practice, I should say, traditional for that. So I had my days where I saw patients all day, the usual family medicine stuff. And then I would teach. I I did everything from like, I I still do hospital service where I would lead a team of residents on our inpatient service, precept residents who are seeing their own patients in clinic. And then I would be sitting in a little room so they can come talk to me for advice and I can double check them and stuff like that. And then over time, because really because we started touring. So we we tour around, well, (laughs) pre-COVID, we toured around the country and sometimes out of the country and did live shows and we were doing it once a month. And that that's hard when you're maintaining an outpatient practice, especially a continuity outpatient mm-hmm, practice. Mm-hmm. That on top of the fact that we had two two little kids, we I kind of started reevaluating what do I want to spend most of my time doing because I love family medicine. But I'll be completely honest, it's it's not primary care, especially I mean, and I don't, this might be a difference, especially in the United States is an exhausting job that Mm -hmm. can take, I mean, that 50, 60, 70 hours of your week to do, because when you're not at the office, you're returning phone calls, you're calling patients, you're checking on things, you're following up on results, you're doing your endless charting. And we're always sort of understaffed and have more work than we have time to do. And I just got to this point where I wasn't loving any of the things I was doing. I was completely Mm -hmm. overwhelmed by all of it. Mm -hmm. And Justin and I together, we stepped back and said, what can we do so that I can really focus on the parts of my job, my life, my work that I love and, you know, find ways to remove the things that are not bringing me joy because, you Mm -hmm. know, if they're not bringing you joy, you're also probably not very good at it. And so what I found the right balance for me, what I've shifted to is I don't have a traditional outpatient practice anymore. The only outpatient medicine I do now is actually at a, we have a day shelter for people facing homelessness in Huntington. And so, and we have a, actually a large unsheltered population here. Mm -hmm. So I work there at least twice, sometimes three times a week and just provide free medical care for anybody who who needs help and they have a nice little clinic there for me and we fund the whole thing through donations and all my supplies and all that kind of stuff and I'm able to like take care of people that way and then the only thing that I still do with my 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 job that I actually get paid for <laughs> is inpatient medicine. I still lead our hospital service team about every other month and get to see our inpatients and work with residents and students and do the teaching stuff that I that I loved. Mm-hmm. So the joy is back. Yes, it was the right balance for me. It gives me a ton of flexibility so that I'm at home with my kids a lot more. I can, once we can tour, I can tour again, hopefully. And I I think that that is the right balance for me. I mean, it it really, family medicine, I love it because you can go so many different ways with it. You can kind of find your niche. And it took me a while to figure out what my niche was, but I I feel like I got there. Sure. I wanted to ask you about, you know, Sawbones is very much rooted in medical history. And when I was introduced to it, it was really those historical things, you know, from, from time and where the origins all, but I've noticed that lately there are those um, issues du jour of the day, if you don't speak French, (laughs) um, transgenderism, self-medicating vaccinations, naloxone, which we'll, we'll, you know, we'll get into that in a few minutes, but are those issues that are coming out of conversations you're having with patients? Are they coming out of this inpatient practice? Is that, is these are just burning questions that cannot be, because they're not historical, all of them. Of course they are. Vaccinations still are and transgenders still are, but they're more like very, very almost like current events in the medical world. Sure. What you, is, is that shift just like, it's is, is it a thing where you, we just can't not talk about this? I think that's very close to the answer. It really, uh, it started if, if I had to put a date on it, 2016 <laughs> is yeah. really when things started to shift. <laughs> what happened uh, then? I, yeah, yeah, I don't know if anything else happened that year, but yeah. I realized at some point that we were doing the show and a lot of people were listening and I hadn't expected that. And they were having fun and that was great and picking up a few little tidbits and, and that was great. And then I realized that if I had this platform and I didn't use it to do some good in the sense of like educating people in a way that they could actually like behave, you know, do something better, like, like take better care Mm -hmm. of themselves and of each other and understand something better that might be more complex that might be affecting all of us that I was really doing a disservice. So 
I started finding ways to started with more historical things that I could connect to today to try to educate people and talk about current issues, including the history. And then I think, honestly, with the pandemic, Justin and I had these conversations about like, well, I mean, history is happening. This Mm -hmm. is this is history. This is something that will be talked about for 100 years and so longer, maybe. But I would why would I not talk about this in that same way? And so then COVID became part of the conversation as well. And uh, it's funny, as we started doing some more of those current kind of episodes talking about COVID, talking about pseudo medicine and fake wellness trends today, mm-hmm. the kinds of stuff that that is really dangerous and harmful that is promoted out there sometimes. Some people didn't like that. Some people are like, keep the politics out of it, stick mm-hmm. to the history. Uh, mm-hmm. But I have to say, overall, the response we got was good. Our audience has gotten bigger and most of the emails we get are positive. So, but yeah, I mean, the, the short answer is I felt like these things have to be talked about. And if I have a platform to do it, that's part of my job. Sure. Sure. You're seeing history being made in front of your own eyes and you're a medical history podcast. So yeah, it would absolutely yeah. make sense. Well, one of the things I want to talk to you about as well, which is a, an episode you guys did, I, I think over the summer was about physician burnout. And, you know, it's obviously, you know, I, you work in America, I work in Canada, but we are seeing the same thing, right? Physicians burnt out, healthcare, uh, the systems in a crisis, all exacerbated by the pandemic. And it, and it's tough. You know, our listenership is probably three quarters, a lot of them professional working women, and a lot of them are physicians. And, you know, my wife's a physician. I don't know if I told you that before, uh, Sydney, but so she's a physician as well. So two physicians in the household. And this whole idea of physician burnout and job satisfaction and and balancing what you, exactly what you were talking about a few minutes ago in terms of finding joy in in what you're doing at work and balancing that with your home life and your family and your children and your other interests and things like that I don't know I mean I guess do you have any ideas in terms of the drivers of burnout and because I know people look up to you as a, as a physician, you know, you have this uh, status with the podcast. Any ideas on what people can do on a personal level or a systems level in terms of, of addressing it? I think it's so tough because I do think a lot of the solutions, and they're probably different because like country specific as well, because mm-hmm, I true. think there's a lot about the American healthcare system that is, I always say it's not broken. It was never broken built to serve patients or really physicians in either. I mean, Mm -hmm. any of the people who work in healthcare or the people who are accessing healthcare, it's not built for us. It's built for administrators and insurance companies and pharmaceutical companies Mm -hmm. and hospitals and all that. Mm -hmm. So I, I I think our system is in some ways uniquely bad, but, (laughs) but I do think systems level changes are a big part of it. And that, that can feel very overwhelming because I think I've read an article, well, it's been years ago, about the concept of moral injury in medicine, mm-hmm. that I work in a system that isn't really built to take care of the people I'm trying to take care of. And so sometimes I'll do something for them that isn't the best because the system won't let me do mm-hmm. the best thing for them. Mm-hmm. And I'm part of the problem then. And, and I've had that conversation many times at home. How many? How much longer can I do this? Because I never feel like I'm really fulfilling my oath. Like I'm really doing all the good I can do and doing and reducing all the harm I can to mm-hmm. people in this system. So I think, I mean, in our country, universal health care would be the solution to that. Yeah, now, yeah. I can't fix that alone. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's very interesting to hear you say this as a doctor. It's so like, I don't know, I feel as, as a, you know, patient, potential patient, potential consumer, it's so distressing. You know, I, I used to be a, a salesman in, in the TV shop, in like an electronic shop. And I remember people would be like, all right, what is your best TV? But the best TV wasn't in stock that day. So you'd be, you know what our best TV is? It's the Sanyo or whatever brand was right in front of me because it's there to think that doctors have to do that too. Like, oh, the best, best is not available. So let me present to you fifth best and present it as the best thing we can do. And I feel like that shouldn't be the case in the medical system. That could be the case at Future Shop in uh, the West Island of Montreal, but that shouldn't be the case in the medical system. It's so distressing. Well, that's exactly it. I mean, the idea that we can use a consumer model with something that mm-hmm. you have no, I mean, you, don't, you ultimately don't choose what diagnoses you get. <laughs> you don't choose what you're sick with and you don't choose that that treatment is the one that's right for your, the idea. I always think that's 
wild because we we have had to switch insurance periodically through the years. And they'll send you these packets where they'll talk to you about your ability to shop around and look for like a different surgeon. Let's say you need your knee replaced. Mm -hmm. Well, you should price compare between these and all this kind of stuff. And it's like, nobody does that when they're sick. Nobody wants to price compare. Nobody wants to shop around for a new hip or shop around because you've been told you have cancer and you need to find the best, you know, radiation oncologist. Like that's wild. No one wants Mm -hmm. to do that. But we talk about that in this country, like, well, that's just normal. That's what you do. You shop around and look for the best deal. It's like, well, no, you don't want it's your health. You just want the right thing to happen. And you want somebody doing it who is knowledgeable and competent and can take good care of you. And that's Mm -hmm. it. And you don't Mm -hmm. want a Mm -hmm. deal. So, I mean, I think that's a big part of the solution. On a personal level, what I found is my inclination, I have a lot of colleagues who have this inclination, is just to get out. I have so Mm -hmm. I I can't tell you how many people are looking for like, what do I do with this medical degree I got that isn't this because I can't do it anymore. Yeah. What I always advise is try to back away a little bit. Try to rebalance your time. If you if you have the ability, I mean, I know how lucky I am that I had the ability to go Mm -hmm. part time Mm -hmm. and to do medicine for free. I mean, I I tell all my friends, come work with me at the at the, you know, at the homeless shelter because what I do there feels like medicine. What I do there feels like what I thought Mm. being a doctor would be like when I was 12. And, you know, I'm actually connecting with people. I spend as much time as they need. Some patients don't want to talk to me for more than five minutes. Some patients need an hour and that's what they get. They get what they need. I do what I can for them. And I really get to make connections with people. And I I think if you can do any kind of volunteering or if you can just back Mm -hmm. away enough to pick and choose the parts of it, that still, you know, give you that, remind you why you went into the field, I I think you can survive. But I know, again, that's, it's a privilege that I can do that because Mm -hmm. so many of my colleagues are saddled with two, three, four hundred thousand dollars of debt. And so exactly. How are they going to do that? Yeah, no, for sure. I wanted to shift this conversation to something that I know is near and dear to your heart. We haven't really talked about it yet. And I'm also going to show off some, some ignorance, you know, West Virginia, as I as I grew up, when I was growing up, West Virginia was one John Denver song. That's what it was. Mountain Mama. Am I allowed to sing? Do we have the rights for the song? <laughs> Asif is shaking his head. No, I think we have the rights. He just doesn't want any singing. Um, you know, take me home, country roads. It was idyllic. It was scenic. It was uh, beautiful. As you get older, you learn about it's also a place of industry. What you don't learn about is the crisis maybe that you, you just don't think about people on the ground. And I think us, if you had an article that you, you sent to me about the subject that I'm, I'm, I'm touching upon. Yeah. So where was, we were, Ali and I were talking about the opioid crisis in, in the U S and definitely there are some areas of the U S that have been harder hit than most. And I was surprised. I know you're involved in it uh, uh, in terms of, of, of seeing patients with opioid addiction and working on harm reduction. But I was surprised. I didn't realize uh, there's a 2019 article from JAMA network open, which looks at the hardest hit States with regards to mortality from synthetic opioids and I didn't realize that West Virginia is one of the hardest hit states, really up there with Ohio, Massachusetts. And so I guess just at the big level, it's kind of like, you know, why do you think West Virginia was so affected? And then kind of then bring it down to the personal level, as Ali was saying, like, what are you seeing with regards to, to patients in the opioid crisis uh, where you work? Yeah, it, we really were. I, there was a recent article that was published, too. I think it was in the Washington Post where they did a it was a colored picture of the United yeah, States I saw that. Yeah. overdose rates and they mm-hmm. had to make West Virginia its own color because we're so yeah. far above everybody else, unfortunately. Have you seen that new show Dope Sick that's out on Hulu? I have not yet. No, I've heard of it. If you if you ever see it, it's I started watching it and it's excellent. And the book by Beth Macy that it's based on is excellent, but I can't watch it because it's just I've I've seen it. I've lived it. Uh, I grew up with it. I know that I know real. it so well that it it's almost too painful to watch it play out slowly. West Virginia is, it's not unique in that we're an impoverished part of the world. We, we have coal as our natural resource, but historically the people who have made the money off of that don't live here. At one point, and I don't know if this is still true, but 80% of West Virginia land is actually owned by people who don't live here. So oh, wow. yeah, we're, we're sort of like, an occupied state <laughs> mm-hmm. because a lot of a lot of industry people who you know are rich and live outside have made all the money off of these resources but the miners and the people who actually lived and did the work 
for a while were that the history of West Virginia is that coal miners and coal mining towns were paid not in money, but in scrip, which was just money that you could only use at coal company owned stores and organizations and oh, things wow. like that. that. And that's sort of the, the history of, of a lot of especially southern West Virginia, people who had, you know, hard labor jobs, blue collar, definitely never really taken care of. Safety was never a priority. And so I think that because of that in our state, not only do you have a lot of a lot of people living in in complete poverty. I mean, when you when you go to part of our residency training is we go to some of the most rural parts of the state. And there are plenty of places in West Virginia that still don't have running water, that still people have dirt floors in the richest nation on earth. You can find that within a three hour drive from where I live. So I think that combined with as as coal left, which I mean coal is a, it's a dirty energy that harms our planet. We needed new, you know, I'm not Mm. pro coal (laughs) by (laughs) any stretch. We needed new sources of energy. It was bound to happen. This is what needed to happen. But you've seen a lot of people fall out of the labor market. They're not working or they're too injured or they have black lung from other years in the, in the mines. And I think that because of that, we have a lot of people living in chronic pain. We always have a lot of people with those sorts of injuries that you would get from doing hard laborious work your whole life. And that combined with the fact that the big pharmaceutical companies, specifically like Purdue Pharma, flooded this area with pain pills when they became Mm -hmm. available. I mean, Mm -hmm. uh, there were a lot of people who were already kind of eating Tylenol or ibuprofen or whatever over-the-counter pain medicines they could just to get through their days. Mm -hmm. And then all of a sudden you had pharmaceutical representatives. And this sort of like, this happened right as I was in medical school. I remember these representatives around when I was in med school. Mm -hmm. By the time I was actually practicing, we were starting to realize what had happened. Mm -hmm. But I remember them coming and and like hosting steak dinners for people. I remember the the DVDs that they would give you to watch about Oxycontin about how, you know, people dancing and saying like, Oxycontin has allowed me to do this. Look at this. I can live my life again. And I mean, that all of that that's dramatized, that was real. I mean, we mm-hmm. all saw it happen that doctors started saying, oh, well, okay, well, I mean, this provides pain relief. And if it's not addictive, if it's safe, I want my patients to feel better. You know, I genuinely hope that this will work. And it, I, I think that was the beginning of, of the end in that uh, you know, in that regard, mm-hmm, that's why mm-hmm. that, that show is so hard for me to watch because you watch it all happen. But people started using pain medication. Of course, a lot of people became addicted because that's what happens with opioids. I don't know why it was ever thought otherwise. Mm-hmm. And what, you know, as I came up through our program, what I was being trained on was, listen, for a while, we thought we needed to aggressively treat pain with narcotics. But now we're seeing all these people become addicted. So your job is to get everybody off of pills. You're going to get lots of patients coming to you. They're going to be on tons of narcotics and your job Mm -hmm. is to wean them all off and they're going to be fine with it. Yeah. Wean everybody off. And so then you have this whole generation of physicians in West Virginia who come up trying to wean everybody off all their pain medicines. And I mean, it's not that easy. It's way more Mm -hmm. complicated than that. And as they started shutting down the the bad doctors, the bad clinics, the pill mills, which existed Mm -hmm. as well, and the pills dried up, the next thing that came was heroin. And so that is that is sort of where we are as a state today. I see a lot of people who are currently using heroin. I see a lot of people who are currently using uh, methamphetamines with heroin or just methamphetamines, but but heroin sort of took over when the pills went away. Mm -hmm. And the stories I hear over and over again are almost always the same. I started using because I got a tooth pulled and my doctor gave me 60 Percocet or you know, I, I had a back injury. And so my doctor started me on Lortab. I mean, it's always something like that. Mm-hmm. And then eventually the doctor says, well, you don't need this anymore and stops it. But the, you know, the addiction is yeah. already there. Mm-hmm. Tell me one thing. I know we have a lot of intelligent listeners, but for the ding dongs out there, Asif, you did say synthetic opioids. You made that distinction. Tell me what synthetic versus non-synthetic opioids are and why one would be more relevant than the other. What, what, what in that article, what's, were they referencing fentanyl? Uh, well, this is the thing. West Virginia is one of the hardest hit states with regards to mortality from synthetic opioids. And uh, I think I thought that was the 
the Oxycontins and the other pills, but maybe not. Yeah, I, I, I mean, you correct me if I'm wrong, Cindy. I thought that they were referring to like street drugs versus uh, synthetic opioids. So like Oxycontin, as you're saying, Percocets and fentanyl. Yeah, that I mean, definitely, especially with fentanyl now. So the the shift has kind of been from, like you said, Oxycontin, anything with hydrocodone, Oxycodone, all of that. As that became less available, the street value of those are very high because they're hard to get now. And they made the pills harder to abuse. They made them mm-hmm. like, instead of tablets, they're like Skittles. So they're harder to crush and, and all that. <laughs> right, uh, that's okay. what I always, I always describe to med students. They're like Skittles now. <laughs> Imagine <laughs> trying to turn a Skittle into powder. <laughs> but the fentanyl is the biggest problem now because fentanyl, which, you know, in medicine, the only time I ever see fentanyl used is like the operating room right, or exactly. sometimes in the emergency room, if somebody comes in with like, a broken femur and they're in acute pain, they'll give them some fentanyl, but or in a, a cancer patient. But fentanyl is certainly not something you would use on a regular basis. Fentanyl is in everything around here, not just heroin, which was already being used by a lot of our a lot of our the patients I take care of. It's in the methamphetamines, which this took me a while to wrap my mind around. And this is why I think it's so valuable if you're going to do this this kind of medicine to talk to people who actually use drugs and let Mm -hmm. them teach you. Because I started asking, why would they put fentanyl, which is expensive, Mm -hmm. in meth, which is very cheap in the Mm -hmm. scale of drugs? And the answer is, because then you get addicted to both. So I had a lot of patients who were just using meth, and they were addicted to meth. Well, they start using it, and there's fentanyl in it, they start craving opioids. And so then they'll Mm -hmm. start buying heroin as well. Most people don't buy fentanyl. It's just fentanyl's in there. Some mm-hmm, people do, mm-hmm, but mm-hmm. but now, I mean, pretty much you can assume anything that people are taking in this area, especially in Huntington. Huntington's been one of the hardest hit areas with the rise of opiate use and and injection drug use. We have the distinction of having like the most overdoses in a twenty four hour period. I mean, it's really this has sort of been and this is where I was born and grew up. This has been kind of ground zero for a lot of these things. But that that has been the big problem now is a lot of the people I take care of who actively use, they know how much heroin they can use. They know or they think they're using meth that if they don't know the fentanyl's in there because it's so much stronger, you can overdose so quickly and so easily. And so we're seeing this giant leap in overdoses because people are unintentionally using fentanyl. And so do you, can you speak a bit to some of the, I, I know you've been doing some volunteer work and fundraising with regards to the idea of harm reduction in these patients who are addicted to, to opioids and naloxone kits and things like that? So the, that is one of the biggest things that once I started doing outreach to people facing homelessness, that was one of the biggest things I had to learn pretty quickly was I understood sort of the idea of harm reduction. Basically, if you're going to engage in a behavior that could cause you harm. While ideally, especially, you know, this is what we're trained as doctors, I should advise you to stop. (laughs) It's the same as driving a car. You can always get in a car accident, but I'm not going to tell you don't ever ride in a car. Instead, Mm -hmm. I'm going to tell you to wear a seatbelt and Mm -hmm. make sure your car has these safety features and all these different things. So the same idea can apply to people who use, especially injection drugs. What can we do to reduce all the harm that may come to you from using those substances? And if at some point you want to enter recovery, we're here to help you with that too. But in the meantime, I'm not going to to judge you or, you know, just harp on you about this behavior. I'm just going to try to help you reduce the harm from it. The days of say no to drugs, the war on drugs, those are over. Those are not used. Those are proven to be completely useless. That's right. Exactly. It, it just doesn't work. I mean, especially once you're addicted, you can't just stop. I right. mean, it's it's a bigger it's bigger than that. Anybody who's ever tried to stop smoking, you know, can can tell us that. But that that was one of the things I had to become pretty good at pretty quickly was one to talk about the easy thing is naloxone or uh, Narcan is the brand that's most known, but naloxone, mm-hmm. which can immediately reverse the like the opiates are bound to the receptors. It can immediately remove those and bind to the receptors instead and reverse an overdose that might be in progress. So if you have someone who has taken too much heroin or something with fentanyl in it, you can give them naloxone and they will breathe again, thank goodness, and you can save their life and hopefully get them to medical care as as quickly as possible. Mm -hmm. I met a paramedic here in Toronto who just, I'll just throw this out there for, you know, in the hopes that maybe it will help somebody one day. A paramedic said to me, if you you hang out with people who party, if you like to party, 
just have a naloxone kit in your car. Like, really? Is that the world we're living in? Well, absolutely. You could save a life. It's, it's really true. It's, it's incredibly easy to administer. There's different forms. I mean, there's, there's naloxone that comes with like a vial and a syringe where you actually have to draw it up and inject it, mm-hmm. which isn't that hard, but it's probably the most cumbersome for people who have never used it before. There's an auto injector, which talks to you and tells you what to do. So that's oh, wow. pretty easy. <laughs> Just like an EpiPen, like something that just Mm -hmm. tells you, like, just do this and and put it on your leg. And there you go. The most frequently used around here is the nasal spray, which is just if you've ever used any kind of nasal spray, you can use this. It's completely easy. And the nice thing about naloxone is that even if the person that you're giving it to hasn't overdosed, if you think maybe they did, but you're not sure, it's harmless. You can give them naloxone. If they didn't do any opiates, it won't do anything. But if they did, you may well save their life. So if you're if you've already called for emergency services and you're waiting for them to show up, this is a very low risk thing that you could do that may make a life or death difference. So I say that, especially in this area, everybody I talk to, I can train you. I can the help that we handed out for free. We have a standing order in the state of West Virginia where if you walk into a pharmacy and ask for naloxone, they will sell it to you. You don't have to have a prescription. Oh, wow. That's great. That's amazing. Because it is such a big problem. Yeah. And so handing out naloxone is one of the biggest things I do. Everybody I see, I'm like, hey, or take it. Even if you don't use, maybe your friend does. If you're hanging out, use wow. the buddy system. Then you have the naloxone while they're they're using. And we train people for free in the community. The health department locally does here. So that's, that's a big piece of what we do. Outside of that, I, I think people get a little uncomfortable with some of the other tenets of harm reduction. I talk very openly. I love to bring residents and students over to, to tell them this stuff because they always their eyes are always so big as I start mm-hmm. talking to a patient about it. <laughs> I talk to them about like injection technique. What do you wow. do? How show me? Not literally. They don't show me injecting, <laughs> but like walk me through what you would do yeah. so I can talk right. to you about how to keep that area as clean as possible. I am not part of this. Or I am. I'm on the advisory board of our syringe exchange program. I don't physically hand out the syringes, but I guide them to our local syringe exchange harm reduction program so that they can get clean needles every time. I have a pamphlet on how to clean your needles. If you you shouldn't reuse them, but if you're going to reuse them, here's how best to clean them. What water do you use? What sources and all this kind of stuff. So all of that is part of the conversation. I've started handing out actually fentanyl test strips so that you can check your product after you've kind of mixed it all up before you inject it. You can dip the little strip in it and it'll tell you if there's fentanyl in it or not. So that that has actually made a big impact because it usually does have fentanyl, but it, it'll reduce the dose a lot of my patients will use. Oh, because they know, okay, if I take too much of this, it's going to be bad news. Oh, wow. That's amazing. Yeah. yeah, exactly. I didn't know if it would impact behavior. A lot of these things I'm sort of piloting and then collecting, like I'm, it's not formal research, although mm-hmm. I am working on a an HIV pre-exposure prophylaxis sort of qualitative study that I'd like to get going where I can give Mm -hmm. people HIV prophylaxis a pill a day who are actively using injection drugs and see if it prevents them Mm -hmm, from mm -hmm. getting HIV. Mm -hmm. Because we actually, in the midst of all these other issues, have an HIV outbreak occurring between Huntington and then 45 minutes away is Charleston, the capital city of West Virginia, which had the CDC's most concerning HIV outbreak in the country this year. So connected to uh, drug use, opioid IV, use as well, in, use, inevitably. Yeah. Yeah. Sydney, we've taken a lot of your time today, but we really appreciate this. And I'm just going to say this on behalf of uh, people like me who would be listening that, yes, you have been talking about a, a broken and, you know, an uninspirational system that you work in. But I think at the same time, it's very inspiring to know that there are people like Dr. McElroy around doing the best that they can to, to, to help people. I don't know. You, you, Absolutely. It's like inspiring and, and against a, an uninspiring backdrop. Your podcast, it, your podcasts are hilarious. They're just fun to listen to and you, you get so much out of them. But there's a reason why when Ollie and I were talking about having you on, we kind of veered to these more serious topics, physician burnout, opioid abuse. It's because you have the ability to talk about anything. You had practice for years and years of talking about medical subjects in a way that everybody can understand. It's something that we would we're aspiring to do on our podcast as well. And but the way you you can convey these simple messages and the amount that you can learn in a short period of time, that's what I want to expose our listeners. If they've never heard your podcast, and most of them have, but if you haven't, just to expose to that because again, you spoke about two of these subjects in a in a way that 
I just think is, is amazing. So we really appreciate you having you on. And again, I apologize for, for going to some of these more serious topics, but uh, like I said, you have a lot of lighthearted stuff and with, with Justin on as well, he provides some of the lighthearted stuff, but we, we, I really want to highlight some of these things because sometimes I think these more serious topics really hit home. It's almost like when you listen to sub bones, you have kind of the lighthearted ones and then you hit them with one of these more serious or very topical subjects. And it almost hits home even more because of that. So, Thanks again for for coming on. We could obviously talk to you for like four more hours. There's so much stuff to talk about, but hopefully we'll have you on another time if you'd be willing. No, thank you. This has been a joy. I really appreciate you all inviting me on. And let me say, I everything you said has been, has been so nice. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> I feel like I'm going to cry. But I, I really don't mind talking about these more serious topics. Please don't apologize <laughs> because that was when I realized that we could do that with the show. It meant a lot to me because it felt like an extension of my practice of medicine in some ways that I could, that we could, that the show could do that too. So mm-hmm, I really yeah. appreciate you saying that and, and giving us space to talk about these things because they're really important. So it means a lot to me. You work in the space that we love being in, which is educational and entertaining. And so it was a joy to have you on Sawbones and Still Buffering are both on MaximumFun.org. And that's where you can hear our, uh, our guest today. Dr. Sydney McElroy, thank you so much again. Thank you all. Thank you so much. So that's our show for today. Let us know what you thought about it. We're available. I liked it. If that's worth anything, that that is worth something. (laughs) It's not. It's not worth nothing. Remember, we're on all social media: Doctor V Comedian, Twitter, Instagram, and and Doctor V Comedian at gmail.com. Let us know what you think about the episode. And remember that although I'm a doctor, as is Sydney. We're not your doctor. Medical issues we talk about are for your interest and information only and are not medical advice. Please consult your medical professionals for actual medical advice. Thanks for listening. Bye.